therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we praise you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for this time of worship that we had as a church and as a family. Lord, we know that we are not worthy and by no means of anything that we have done, Lord, that we have this chance to come here like this. But it is only through your Son, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for that. Lord, as for the next few minutes, Lord, that we spend in your presence and as we hear from your word, we pray that you would bless um, your speaker, Lord. We pray that uh, you would give him all the grace that he needs to speak from your word, Lord. Um, I pray that you would open our hearts and minds, Lord, and help us to receive your word, Lord, and apply it in our lives as well, Lord. We ask all this in the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Morning. So we have a lot of accomplished uh, preachers in this congregation. Um, I don't count myself among them. And they always start with a story. Right, John? Or a joke. And uh, I usually don't. So anyway, so today I thought I'd start with a story. Um, and uh, I was a little afraid because I'm sure the story has been used by somebody because... One thing I discovered is all preachers go to the same website to get the story. (laughs) So, it may not be a a unique story. But anyway, here goes. So, in a small town, there were two brothers who over the course of many years cheated, swindled, robbed, and generally stole from everyone that they ever did business with. The entire town and surrounding community reviled and despised these two brothers as everyone was aware of just how disreputable and dishonest they were. One day, one of the brothers mysteriously died. Have you heard the story, Philip? You haven't? Okay, good. So one of the brothers mysteriously died. And although they had never attended church, the one remaining brother went to the local pastor and he offered vast sums of money if he would come to the funeral and say all of the appropriate words. And he also offered him a large bonus. But only, only if he would, during the course of the eulogy, refer to his brother as a saint. The pastor was troubled by, uh, by the request. However, it was a very poor church and um, the church desperately needed uh, repairs. And all the parishioners heard about the... Uh, the pastor's dilemma, and they were curious as to what would the pastor do. So the funeral began and the church was packed, not packed because they all came to pay their respects to the person, but they all came to see and figure out how was the pastor going to uh, handle this situation. So uh, the church was packed and the pastor started with the usual prayers and he followed the rites and traditions as required by the church teachings. And then in closing, after referring to the man in the box, he paused and he turned to face the remaining brother and he began, as you all know, as you all know, the departed was an awful individual, you know, who robbed, cheated, swindled, and stole from everyone he ever did business with. However, compared to his brother, He was a saint. Was that a good story, John? So the point here is, you know, uh, is that, you know, sometimes we often measure our holiness or our worth by comparing to other people. You know, we, uh, we tend to look at other people and say, you know what, I'm 
better than that person. Compared to him, I'm a saint. But that's not really how God looks at us, is it? In this passage, we, uh, you know, the Apostle Paul gets into a lot of uh, very difficult topics. And this is uh, in a section of the, uh, of the letter to the Ephesians where, uh, you know, where he's talking about, uh, uh, about our walk, our walk as believers. In fact, if you look at uh, just chapters 4 and 5, of Ephesians, and you know, he starts off Ephesians, of course, uh, laying a foundation by explaining all of our spiritual blessings in Christ, who we are in Christ. And then in chapter 2, he talks about the transformation that the Lord Jesus Christ brings into the life of a, of a dead sinner uh, and how he makes us alive. And then he talks about how he adds us into the church, and in chapter 3, is all about the mystery of the church and how uh, you know the church is the most uh, precious um, uh, organism in the eyes of God and how God uses the church to show the manifold wisdom, His manifold wisdom to the principalities and powers in the air. And then, in, starting in chapter four, He starts to uh, to talk about the practical truths. He says, "Now that you know who you are, now that you know that you have been redeemed." Uh, by the blood of Christ, now that you know that you are a part of, of this, uh, this body of Christ, the church, now that you know that, how should you then live? And we find in chapter 4, verse 1, uh, he says that, you, you, that we are to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. We find in uh, chapter 4, verse 17, that we are to no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk. Here he, he, talk, he talks about it in a negative way. We are not to walk as the Gentiles walk. In uh, chapter 5 verse 2 which we just read, uh, it says we are to walk in love. We are to walk in love. In verse 8, also in the passage that was read this morning, it says we are to walk as children of light. And then in chapter 5 and verse 15, he says you are to walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So why is there so much focus on the walk? And Paul gets very explicit in calling out certain sins uh, in the life of the church. And, uh, uh, and I believe it's because there clearly was a problem in the walk of the believers in the Ephesian church. Here we have a, a people that have been redeemed from, uh, from the culture around them. This was a culture that was not known for high moral standards. In fact, it was known for all kinds of immorality. Uh, and, uh, and, and so these people were saved and very often, sometimes even though they were saved, even though they had been redeemed, yet they continued to live and bring into the church uh, these, uh, these uh, habits, these uh, practices, these uh, immoralities from their past life. In fact, if you look at all of Paul's epistles, he's very explicit about this, this matter of sexual immorality in the church. In uh, uh, the book of 1 Corinthians, we find there that he, um, he uh, uh, uses very strong language to, to condemn the church for the fact that they are tolerating immorality in their midst. And he talks about a certain brother who was engaged in sexual immorality and he says that you need to put him out of the church uh, as, as punishment. And so uh, clearly there were a lot of problems in the early church. And clearly these problems did not just go away. There have been problems within the church throughout the ages, and, uh, and these problems persist uh, even today in the church. Uh, and very often, you know, our, our faith uh, sadly has become more of a, a, a cultural faith and a shallow faith. Um, you know, many of us have been born and brought up in a certain tradition, and, and very often when, um, when, we, when, we, uh, when we come across people who have various problems in their life or various issues in their, in their moral life, uh, we find that the foundation is not there, that they don't really understand who they are. They don't really understand from Scripture how uh, they are to live. Um, you know, and, and, and we have sort of brought into a, uh, I'll call it a cultural brethrenism, not into a biblical faith life, not into a, a Bible-based way of looking at things, looking at problems, looking at situations, looking at how we need to live our life. And you know, at the judgment seat of Christ, 
uh, what denomination you came from or what your pedigree is, none of this is going to matter. And we are all going to be, we are all going to be standing before that judgment seat. You know, yes, we've been spared the judgment of whether we go into eternal life or not, but all believers are going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ and our works are going to be judged. And in 1 John it says that, that some will be ashamed when they face the Lord. And I think the scripture clearly calls us to a life that if we live it that way, we will not be ashamed, but we will be proud to stand before the Lord, uh, the Lord who died for us. But there will also be those who are ashamed because their life did not measure up to that standard. It did not measure up to the calling with which we have been called. And this, this morning I want to talk about, uh, about this matter of, uh, uh, of, uh, of sin in the life of the church. And I know we have, uh, we have uh, uh, you know, a lot of visitors here and uh, you know, the reason for our messages is not to impress visitors but it is to speak to the church. Right? And one of the things that we do here is we are not perfect and, and, and I will talk about sin within the church but you know, Paul's letters to us show that, that even in the early church they had major problems with sexual immorality and we have had our own uh, share of problems. You know, we have a, a, a young church made up of many young people and, and, and uh, sadly many come to us without a strong foundation in scripture even though they've been brought up in godly homes, even though they've been attending um, you know, congregations and listening to the word of God, yet their foundation is not biblical, rather it is cultural, rather it is based on ritual and tradition. Um, but we here, we, we strive to take on problems head on. We will teach about them from scripture. We will deal with sin and the sinner according to, uh, according to what that sin is, according to scripture and with grace, with the ultimate goal of bringing the fallen sinner to repentance and restoration. And I want to talk here in particular about about what Paul is addressing here in Ephesians chapter 5 that we just read uh, the first few verses of this chapter and he talks about a particular sin in the church and uh, he starts talking about it in verse 3 and he says fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. So Paul lays out a standard here, a standard of practice and that standard is very simple. He says, let it not even be named among you. So there is a sin of a type that should not be anywhere near the church. It should not enter the doors of the church. It should not be found in the church. It should not even be uh, uh, present in, in a way that, that you would even have to mention it. But of course, Paul himself is talking about it here as a way of warning, as a way of calling people out of this. And giving, setting this example of how the church ought to conduct itself, how the people in the church uh, should conduct itself. And he says, let it not uh, even be named. Let it not even be named. And I just checked a few other translations on this and, and some of them say uh, as follows. It must not even be hinted at among you. For as believers, our way of life, whether in public or in private, reflects the validity of our faith. It must not even be hinted among you. Let it not be once named among you. Or another translation says, there must be no hint, uh, no hint, mention, rumor of sexual sin among you. Those things are not right, proper, fitting for God's people. And this is the worst kind of thing that can happen in the life of a church, is to have this kind of sin within that church. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what is the specific sin here? And Paul identifies it in, um, uh, in, uh, in verse 3 and he says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you. So he uses the term fornication. Now, when you look at the English definition of fornication, it basically means, uh, uh, you know, having sexual relationships with somebody outside of marriage. Uh, uh, and then he also goes on to say all uncleanness and covetousness. Covetousness means to desire something that does not belong to you. Uh, and then he goes on uh, and he says, uh, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So Paul talk, puts all of these things together, and the word that he uses for 
Fornication here is the Greek word porneia. Okay, porneia, which from which we get the if that if that phrase sounds familiar, it is um, uh, it comes from it's the same root from which we get the word the English word pornography. So it's speaking not just about technically fornication, but all kinds of sexual immorality, all kinds of sexual sins, whether it be adultery, fornication, homosexuality, pornography, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. And then he talks about filthiness, you know, anything that's filthy in the eyes of God. Uh, he talks about foolish talking or silly talking. He talks about coarse jesting, which means obscene, vulgar joking. And I think uh, the reason that he groups all of these together is because these are all somewhat related. Uh, you know, these kind of things like coarse jesting, uh, obscene, vulgar joking, the kind of talk uh, that, uh, that Paul is refer uh, referencing here, uh, you know, they sort of create a mindset and an atmosphere that puts us on a slippery slope that leads down towards much more deeper sins uh, such as sexual immorality and fornication. You know, our talk with each other, the things that we watch, the, the movies that you watch, the TV shows that you watch, are they leading you down this path towards sexual sin? Are they causing you to, to are they causing a degradation of your moral compass in your mind that makes it more and more acceptable to go deeper and deeper without you even realizing it, that allows you to rationalize uh, deeper and deeper forms of, of sin? So it goes, starts off with, with, with joking and coarse uh, joking and obscene uh, talk and then moves its way down, downward towards more and more serious sexual immorality, ultimately leading to the worst kind of sexual immorality, immorality. And I think that's why the Apostle Paul is putting all of this together in the context of calling the church and telling them that these kind of things, this kind of filthiness, this kind of uncleanness, this kind of covetousness, you know, desiring what is not yours, right? What, what is the only, the, the only uh, acceptable way to fulfill the sexual desire that God has given you is in the context of marriage. To do it with anything else or anybody else is covetousness. It's, 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 it's seeking after what is not, does not belong to you. And that's why he brings the word, uh, the sin of covetousness into this context. You know, all sin is not treated equally in scripture. You know, God is a holy God and yes, every sin is sin, uh, you know, and he cannot tolerate any sin. But it's very clear as we go through scripture that, um, you know, that the sin of sexual immorality is, is sort of elevated as being more serious. And it's not just in the New Testament, but you go back to the Old Testament, you look at some of the punishments that, um, uh, that in the law are prescribed for uh, sexual immorality. And they are far greater. They are all the way up to death. If we just look at a couple of passages uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, you know, it talks about uh, sexual immorality. The sin of sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 18. It says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So it distinguishes here between all other sins which are done outside the body versus sexual immorality which is a sin done against your own body. If you go back a chapter to 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 11 it says, But now I have written uh, to you to uh, not to keep company with anyone named a brother. He's talking here about about believers, about a brother, one who is named a brother, or is at least a brother in name, who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. So you see here again, uh, you know, the person who is sexually immoral, immoral, the way that you deal with him is again called out. You know, the sad truth is that, is that if you look at the church as a whole, this is an area where we have failed and we continue to fail. And I'm not just talking about this church, I'm talking about, uh, you know, churches in general. You know, there are so many instances, <clears throat> even recently, where I keep hearing about people in various churches who are, who are involved in adultery, who are, uh, you know, families breaking apart. And it's very sad when we see this happen. And we think that, that we are immune from this because, you know, we hold to certain 
uh, principles or we hold to certain truths in scripture and because we are a Bible believing church but the fact is we are not immune to that. Let me, let me give you two specific instances uh, uh, that I want to just share with you uh, and, uh, and just to set the context for what we want to talk about as we go into the study of this passage here in Ephesians. Uh, a young man you know, did not put boundaries on his association with friends. Okay, young man who is a church-going believer. Involved, got involved in regular get-togethers with his colleagues at work, which involved drinking, and eventually led to multiple sexual encounters with a female colleague. Okay, we live in, an, in a culture where this kind of behavior is normal. You know, many of you who are college students, you go to, um, you know, colleges where, uh, you know, drugs, uh, you know, sleeping around with partners, uh, drinking, smoking, all of these things are very common. So it's not a surprise that people would get into this. Uh, here's another situation. Uh, you know, another person involved in a live-in relationship for almost two years, a sexual relationship with an unbeliever, leading this person on to expect that he would marry her. <clears throat> so these are real cases, real situations that have happened among believers. And I want you to just think about this as we go through it. And, and I want to also tell you one more thing about both of these cases. Okay, they happened in this very church. In this very church. And as elders, as we deal with these things and as we grieve over this and we seek to, to counsel and bring people out of it and show the grace of God and bring them to repentance and restoration, it makes us wonder, you know, how many more are there? How many more are there? Maybe they haven't advanced to that level. But we know there are other so-called relationships. You know, these days people have this term relationship. You know, I'm in a relationship. You know, that's your Facebook status. You know, you're either single or married or you're in a relationship. And you ask somebody, what's going on? Well, I'm in a relationship. What exactly does that mean? How far does a relationship go? And we've come across cases of everything from, uh, you know, emotional attachments to various levels of physical intimacy. And we don't think this is something that we can or should hide under the, you know, under the cover thinking that, you know, it, it's a blot on the church and why is this happening? But it's something we need to deal with from scripture. We need to warn the believers and we need to go back to scripture and understand why is this so important? Why is sexual purity so important? Why is it important that sexual immorality stays outside the doors of the church, the doors of our life? Let's go back to the scriptures here. So what does, what, what is this, why is this sin so bad? Uh, let's read uh, verse 5. Uh, the apostle Paul says, for this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you <clears throat> with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. These are things that God hates. And he does not permit them in his kingdom. You know, when you read this, I don't think he's saying there that if you commit a sexual sin, that you're not going to be in the kingdom. But he's talking about the fact that, that when you look at what is happening in the kingdom, you know, <clears throat> there is no idolatry there. There is no sexual immorality uh, of those who have inheritance in the kingdom. Uh, there is no covetousness. There is none of these things. When you look at uh, similar passages in, in the book of Revelation, you know, we see that, that, uh, that uh, scene in heaven and it talks about the makeup uh, of the heavenly kingdom there. So let's turn to Revelation 21 and verse 27. It says, but there shall by no means enter it, enter it anything, this is the new Jerusalem, uh, that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. There is nothing that will enter it except those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life and there will be nothing entering it that defiles or causes an abomination or a lie. And then uh, 
also uh, Revelation 22 verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city but outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. You see these things are meant to characterize the people who are outside the kingdom. Those who are outside the new Jerusalem. Those who, are, who do not have an inheritance in the, in the kingdom of God. And what Paul is saying here is that don't you know that this is not the, the lifestyle. This is not what should characterize the life of a child of God. And he says that very clearly. He says that don't you know that, uh, coming back to Ephesians 5, that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience who behave in this manner. He's saying that God punishes unbelievers who live like this with his wrath. They suffer the consequences of this. This is not something that you should do. You too will suffer the consequences if you do these things, but that is not supposed to be characteristics of, of you and me. That is not the lifestyle that we are called to. And we are not to take this for, for granted. When we live like them, you know, when we live like the world, we are being partakers with them, when, whereas we are called to be separate and to be holy. Uh, in, in verse eight, 8 he says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Don't take these sins for granted. Understand how abhorrent such things are to God. Do not be deceived about what God says of these things of these things. Verse 6 he says, Let no one deceive you with empty words. You know, if anyone is telling you that it's okay to do this, that is not true. That is deception. That is the words of Satan trying to deceive you away from the truth, away from the life that God wants of you. Let's take a little detour and look at the anatomy of sin. Turn to James chapter 1, verse 14. The apostle James here explains very clearly how Sin works. James 1 verse 14 and 15. But each one, and pay careful attention here, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You are first, look at the, the progression here. You, everyone is tempted when he is drawn away, okay, drawn away from where he should be towards a place where he shouldn't be. He is drawn away by his own desire. You are drawn to the wrong people, towards coarse jesting, towards debauchery, towards drinking, towards uh, things that, that degrade your moral compass towards people who revel in the wrong environments. And then it says what? That he is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire and enticed. And as you are drawn away, it is your own desire that is drawing you away, that is leading you to being enticed. You are enticed to join with them in these activities. You are enticed to live a certain way because that is what is acceptable to the world. And then what does it say? When desire has conceived... You know, James uses the, the analogy of the conception of a child here. You know, the conception of a child. You know, when the child is conceived, the child is there, that, that organism is there, it's alive. It is growing, but it's not visible. You know, we have several mothers here. You know, you look at them, they're all at different stages. Some of them you can look and see that they have a baby growing inside of them. Some of them we only find out when we put their names up. You know, from the moment of conception, that, that little organism is there and it's growing. These things start small. A relationship, small actions of physical intimacy, leading to more and more. You are enticed. You are grow, drawn away. You are enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it conceives when you commit that sin, what happens? It gives birth. Nine months after a baby is conceived, you actually see it out in the world. The fruit comes out. It gives birth to sin. And then what? Sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. It will happen. The fruits will come out. 
you can't keep it hidden forever no woman who has conceived can keep that baby hidden forever it's going to come out you know, many of us continue living in sin in denial thinking that you know it's not going to come out nobody is going to find out i can just continue you are living a lie and this sin of sexual immorality has dire dire consequences there has consequences in your own personal life it has consequences in your witness to others it has consequences in the life of the church let's just look at each of those it has consequences in your personal life that you cannot escape don't think that you're going to escape the consequences of sin don't think that you can conceal it you know proverbs 28:13 says he who covers his sins will not prosper but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy it has one sin leading to more sins and unimaginable uh, consequences including things like pregnancies harassment by the person that you have wronged societal consequences and we have had to sit across from parents who had to come face to face with the uh, with the sin of their children and they were so shattered and broken parents who were who are very active in their churches very well known absolutely shattered don't know what to do there are consequences to you there are consequences to your family there are consequences to all those around you and every case that we have dealt with one sin leads to more sin it leads to lying it leads to deception it leads to uh, concealing your sins dire consequences in your personal life it puts you into situations that you have no idea how you're going to get out of it and it's only by the grace of god that you can somehow get yourself that he can bring you out of it somehow if you repent it has consequences in your witness to unbelievers when you do immoral things with unbelievers you hinder the work of the gospel in their lives you have lost your testimony how can you show them the results of a gospel transform life you know we've had cases where some people have been engaging in 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 sexual immorality with somebody on one side and then trying to send them somewhere else to find out about the gospel how does that work how do you expect them when you are exhibiting uh, the most uh, despicable immoral behavior with them you expect them to hear the gospel and get saved it destroys our witness as a church when you get the trust of someone and when you uh, abuse them abuse that trust when you take advantage of them it destroys that witness it destroys the christian testimony before them and thirdly it impacts the life of the church it's not just about you and the other person you sully the church you bring uncleanness into it you weaken the faith of others first corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6 talks about this this is where he's talking about the man who was in immorality and what the corinthian church should do and he says in verse 6 your glorying is not good they were tolerating this man they were glorying in it he says do you not know that a little leaven <coughs> a little leaven leavens the whole lump therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump a little leaven leavens the whole lump you know we are part of one body i don't think people understand that you are not you are not on an island in ephesians 3 he talks about the church that it's every part every joint coming together doing its part that 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 brings about the growth of the body but if you bring a little leaven into that body you are leavening the whole lump you allow the devil room to get into this church body and work there and destroy it you create a situation where the church has to apply discipline to you sometimes publicly and that's not a pleasant thing it takes away peace in the church it discourages other believers people start wondering what's going on dire consequences in your own personal life dire consequences in your witness to unbelievers 
and dire consequences in the life of the church. So what is the antidote to this? What is the solution to this? Let's come back to Ephesians 5. Three things. And when I talk about these three things in every situation that we have dealt with, are dealing with, you know, these things are missing. Okay, it's when you depart from these things that, that you start getting on that slippery slope and you start sliding towards immorality in your life. Number one, be imitators of God. Be imitators of God as dear children. You know that story I started off with. You know, compared to his brother, he's a saint. Your standard is not your brother. Your standard is not your sister. He is not the person who sits next to you every week in church. It is God Almighty. The God who said, Be ye holy as I am holy. Be imitators of God as dear children. The word imitators here is the Greek word mimetis, which comes from the root. We get the word mimic from that. You know, what is a mimic? Mimic is someone who carefully studies how someone behaves and then uh, replicates their behavior, replicates their motions, replicates their, their actions. In scripture, it simply means to follow an example. And Paul here puts out the ultimate example. Your example is God himself. The same God who is good. The same God who is holy and just. The same God who is always truthful. And why should we imitate God? Be imitators of God as dear children. Dear children. Be imitators of God as dear children. Because you are his beloved, his esteemed, his favorite, his dear children. We are dearly loved children of God. And therefore you should desire to follow and imitate him. I'm sure many of us growing up, you know, we wanted to emulate our parents because we love them so much. You know, I remember when I left... Um, home I left home when I was 15 years old quite young I was sent into an environment where I could have easily fallen into sin that's what everybody around me was doing far away, far away from home but the one thing that kept me going was that I always remembered my mother and I remembered how much time she spent in prayer and I knew that I couldn't allow myself to get into sin and, and, uh, and, and bring sorrow to that mother's heart because I loved her so much. We need to love God in the same way. It's not about my mother. More important is that I cannot bring dishonor to the name of God who loved me so much and gave his own son to die for me. Why do believers fall into these sins? Because they don't understand who they are in Christ. Because they don't understand who God is to them and what God has done for them. We come week after week, we participate in this for a reason, to remember. It is not just a piece of bread and it's not just a cup. It is symbolic of the, of the, the body and the blood, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. How can you go against a God who sacrificed his own son for you? So that he can make you his dear child. Be imitators of God as dear children. I want us to introspect. Do we have a desire to be more like God? Do we have that burning desire to imitate God? Are we evaluating where am I? When am I going to get there all the way up to God's standard in this life? But we can make progress. Be imitators of God, number one. Secondly, Secondly, verse 2, we are to walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling aroma. Now, when we hear this thing, walk in love, you know, we always have these, these, these secular images. You know, we have this image that walk in love means I got to walk around and hug everybody and be nice to them. That's not what he's talking about. Okay, and just to be absolutely clear, that's not what he's talking about. Paul tells us what he's talking about. He says, walk in love. How? As Christ has loved us. And how did Christ love us? 
given himself for us and how did he give himself for us by becoming an offering and a sacrifice to god for a sweet smelling aroma okay he became an offering and a sacrifice to god for a sweet smelling aroma how did how did christ become a sacrifice to god let's go to hebrews chapter 10 how did christ become a sacrifice to god it tells us very clearly hebrews 10 and verse 5 Hebrews 10 verse 5 Therefore when he came into the world he said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body you have prepared for me in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure then i said behold i have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will o god how did he become a sacrifice how did he become a sacrifice john by doing god's will by being obedient to the will of god that is the sacrifice you see he is referring to the fact that the real sacrifice god one was not you know sacrificing some bull and some goat on the altar a burnt offering there on the altar that's not what he wanted that's not what god wanted he wanted a person who would be a sweet smelling sacrifice by doing his will and he goes on to say previously saying sacrifice and offering burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire nor had pleasure in them you know god didn't really have pleasure in those which are offered according to the law that is the old uh, the the first covenant then he said behold here's what jesus says behold i have come to do your will o god he takes away the first that he may establish the second by that will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all behold i have come to do your will it is the sacrifice of obedience the sacrifice of obedience that's what we call i don't have time to do this but you go through the rest of hebrews 10 and he talks about it in verse 16 he talks about god having god's law in your heart not in the book but in your heart in verse 22 23 he says for this reason we we purify ourselves holding fast to our hope and then he talks about our relationship with each other he says we stir up one another to love and good works in verse chapter 10 hebrews verse 24 and then in verse 25 it says that we do not give up the meeting together uh, and exhorting of ourselves god is more delighted the sacrifice that he wants is a sacrifice of obedience that's what he said in samuel he says that uh, you know that i i do not want uh, sacrifice i want obedience that is the ultimate sacrifice that god is looking for and then he puts it all together paul puts it all together in romans chapter 12 verse 1 and 2 where he says i beseech you by the mercies of god that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice a living sacrifice uh, holy and acceptable to god a sweet smelling aroma do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and therefore you prove the perfect will of god our mind should be so renewed and so spiritually sharp that we can examine easily know the will of god and we can obey it we are to walk in love as christ loved us how did christ love us he was obedient to god we are to walk in obedience that's what paul means when he says we are to walk in love the greatest evidence of walking in love is to offer ourselves in a life of complete obedience to the will and to the word of god john 14 verse 15 the lord says if you love me what will you do keep my commandments if you love me keep my commandments many believers fall into sin because their minds are not truly being transformed because they are not offering their bodies as a living sacrifice you know we are offering our bodies as a sacrifice to the world and not to god take a look at what is driving your decisions what is driving the reason for your existence it is worldly things it is not a far uh, you know transition from that towards sexual immorality finally we are to walk in the light you know how do you transform your mind by walking in the light chapter 5 and verse 8 of ephesians you were once darkness but now you are light in the lord walk as children of light for the fruit of the spirit is in all goodness righteousness and truth finding out what is acceptable to the lord and have no fellowship 
with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes, uh, for whatever may, uh, makes manifest is light. We are to walk in the light. We are to imitate God. We are to live in obedience and love as Christ did. And then we are to walk in the light. You are to know who you are, who you were and who you are today. You were once darkness, but you are now light in the Lord. You are to walk as children of light. You know, when we talk to people who are into the sin, it's tough for us to understand how they could continue going into this again and again and keep on for months and years in this behavior. We ought to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And how are we to walk as children of light? Verse 10, number 1, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Find out what is acceptable to the Lord. How do you find out what is acceptable to the Lord? How do you find out what is acceptable to the Lord? By reading the word. Are you regularly reading the word of God? Let me tell you, when we go back into each of these situations and dig into it, we find out that the moment people start going away from reading the word of God, the moment they start um, skipping the meetings of the church, it's not about coming to a meeting. Okay, Those are just revealing what's really in your heart. Okay, those are revealing where your spiritual walk is. It's just a symptom. Okay, there are people who can come to the meetings and their heart is not there. I know that. Okay, it's when they start associating more with outsiders than they are with people in the church. When they start enjoying the company of others more than they do fellowship with their believers. That they start going away in the wrong path. You know, when someone asks you, are you having your quiet time? It's not just to make you feel bad. It's because we really care about you. And if you are not reading the word of God, let me tell you, you are not going to be able to walk in the light. Secondly, find out what is acceptable with the Lord. Secondly, what does he say? Have no fellowship with the unfruitful words of life. There is no ambiguity here, is there? Have no fellowship. Because the works of darkness do not produce the fruit of the Spirit. The works of darkness are shameful. We should not even speak of them. Are you engaged in the works of darkness? Pornography? Watching things on TV and movies? Entertainment? Drugs? Partying? How do you spend your time? Have no fellowship. You know, if you keep having fellowship with the works of darkness, then don't be surprised when the darkness overcomes you. Third, expose the work of darkness in your life. You know, one thing that is so disturbing is that people get into sin and even though they are convicted, they can come here every Sunday and even partake of the Lord's table and then go right back into that sin of sexual immorality. How shameful! Expose the works of darkness in your life. All things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Bring it out into the light. Seek godly counsel. Repent. Throw yourself on the mercy of God. As much as these situations grieve us, we have the joy of seeing how the power of God works in the midst of the deepest sin. Of those who confess, those who come out, those who repent. And then grow closer in their walk with the Lord. There is only hope for you if you expose your sin and you repent. Let me go to one more passage. Romans chapter 13. Romans 13 verse 11. And do this, do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness. Have no fellowship with the works of darkness. Let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as 
in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. It's high time to wake out of our sleep. If you are sleeping, if you are sleeping in sin, do not be a sleeping Christian. Cast off the works of darkness, revelry, drunkenness, lewdness. Make no provision for the flesh. Put on the armor of light. That's what God's call to you this morning is. Are you living as an imitator of God? Maybe you've not gotten into this yet. Maybe, you, maybe things are not as bad in your life. But if you're not living as an imitator of God, if you are not walking in love as Christ, that is the love that leads to obedience to the word of God, if you are not giving yourself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma, if you are not walking in obedience to his word, walking in holiness, if you are not walking in the light, then there is always a possibility that you are going to end up in this kind of immorality. You know, I've been reading in my quiet time in Genesis. I just want to close with uh, what God tells Abraham. You know, God comes back to Abraham a few times, at least three times, I think, to renew his covenant with him. And uh, in uh, chapter 17, verse 1, it says, let me close, I'll close with this. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. And these are the words that caught my attention. A very simple command that God gives to Abraham. He says, walk before me. Number one, walk before me. Number two, be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. What does it mean to walk before God? What does it mean to walk before someone? It means you're walking in their presence. It means they are looking at you, you know, like a child walking in the presence of, of, his, of his father or mother, and they're always watching him. You know, and when you are doing something before your father or mother, you want to impress them, you want to make them happy. Walk before me. Remember, we as believers... As children of God, we are to always walk before God. And then he says, and be blameless. What does it mean, blameless? This, this word blameless is used repeatedly in scripture. In fact, it's one of the qualifications for being an elder. You know, he must be blameless. Does blameless mean that you're perfect? Does that mean that you're sinless? No. You know, it means that when people look at your life, they cannot point a finger and say, but he, but John, but Stephen. You know, when they look at your life, the general trajectory of your life, they cannot point at you and say, no, but he is a guy who does this and this and this. But he is a guy who, who I've seen in this place and that place. I've seen him engaging in this behavior and that behavior. We are to be blameless before the world. Blamelessness is something, it's, it's others' perception of you. Yes, internally I might have sins, I might have sinful thoughts as a human being, you know, which I am to confess and before God and seek forgiveness, yes. But what are my actions? Am I blameless in my action? God's covenant with Abraham, he says, walk before me and be blameless. If, if people saw what is going on in your life today, are you blameless? If God, if you are walking before God and he sees what you are doing, how would you feel? Let's close our eyes. I want us to think about what we've heard. This is a message for this church. You know, I talked about a couple of cases that we have been dealing with. Some even ongoing. You know, we could have kept quiet about this. We could have they swept it under a rug and but you know our goal is to see every person here to grow into a holy life with God it is to use 
the situations that God brings into our church as a way to teach and to warn. I believe that's why God allows these things. At least one reason why he allows them. And our concern is, we don't know what is going on, you know, in your life. But you do. And as you sit here this, this morning, I want each of you to examine in the deep recesses of your heart. Are you somewhere along that continuum of that we read about in James? Of sin? Are you being drawn away by your desire, the lust of the flesh, into the wrong environments? Are you being enticed into sin? Has your desire already conceived and produced sin in your life? Has that sin been full grown? You don't know all the consequences that can happen. Some of the situations that I talked about have led to pregnancy. How would you deal with that if that happened to you? I can tell you one thing. As people who uphold the word of God, we would insist that you take care of the consequences of your sin. Imagine what that would do to your life. I don't want to mince any words here. This is, this is a serious thing here. A little leaven leavens a whole lump. And our prayer, my prayer is that the Lord would reveal and bring out every such instance of this kind of sin that is there. And I don't want to make it seem like it's a pervasive problem. I know it's not. But may he also use it to keep those who are not there from getting into it, from understanding the seriousness of it. This is very serious. This kind of behavior and action goes against who we are. We are the children of the light. We are going to be in the kingdom of God where such behavior doesn't even have a right to come anywhere near the gates of his kingdom. If that's who you are, then how can you engage in this behavior in this life? You are called not just for the life to come, but for this life as well, to live as a testimony for the Lord. And I'm just going to keep quiet for a few seconds. If, if you are convicted, if there's anything going on in your life, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you're a man, a woman, I want you to confess that to God. I want you to repent and I encourage you to come and speak to us privately so we can help you on your path to repentance and restoration. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for, for your word, the word of God. The place where we find out what is acceptable to the Lord and what is not acceptable to the Lord. We want to thank you, Lord, that it speaks to such situations, Lord. We know that the company of the redeemed is not perfect. We know that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We know he brings sin into the life of the church. But we thank you, Lord, that there is hope in you. There is hope in Christ. There is restoration for Christ has died for all our sins upon that cross and he paid the penalty in full. Lord, I just want to pray for this church. I want to pray for protection, Lord. Protection from the 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 the, um, the fiery darts of the of the enemy, Lord. 
I want to pray for each and every person, each and every family. Lord, if there is anyone here, Father, who is engaged in sexual immorality, I pray, Lord, that your light would expose it for their own good, for the honor of your kingdom, so that they might repent, so that they might be restored, so that if they are really not saved, they may come to true faith, Father. And perhaps there are many who are not into that, Lord, and yet their life is lukewarm, Father. They are not, their life is not a sweet-smelling aroma to you, Father. It is not a life of true obedience that is driven by obedience to you. I pray, Lord, that they would, they would commit themselves, Lord. I want to pray for each and every one of us, Lord. We know that we are all, Lord, as your word says, let him who stands watch lest he fall. Lord, every single one of us are susceptible to fall. So I want to pray for your hedge of protection around each of us, Lord. Those who are in leadership, those who are the influencers in this church, that you will protect us from the evil one, Lord. Lord, I want to thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you, Lord, for the word that is ministered. I pray that it will continue to work in the hearts of every single person here. Thank you, Father, in the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.